Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Camille Crittenden. I direct the Data and Democracy Initiative here at Citrus. We're very pleased to have Professor Roger Bales here to talk with us about water information management and how it can transform water management in California. Before we get started, I just want to also welcome our remote viewers. The presentation is being webcast live to other Citrus campuses at Santa Cruz, Davis, and Merced, as well as to anyone who is in their uh, home or office watching. Um, we're very pleased to have you with us. And I want to mention at the end, we'll have some time for question and answer and welcome your questions here from the audience in Berkeley. But we are also following the Twitter stream. And if you would like to ask a question, feel free to do that via Twitter using hashtag CitrusRE. So C-I-T-R-I-S-R-E. And we'll try to work that into the Q&A as well. There will be an I4 Energy talk this week on Friday at noon on building efficiency and sustainability in the tropics by Costa Spanos. So that will be one of the last citrus events before we all uh, hopefully go on holiday next week for the spring break. There won't be any research exchange talk or I4 Energy talk next week. So please enjoy your break and then join us again when school resumes after that. Professor Bales joined the University of California Merced as Professor of Engineering in June 2003 and is one of Merced's inaugural faculty. Dr. Bales received his BS from Purdue University and MS from UC Berkeley and PhD from the California Institute of Technology. He worked as a consulting engineer from 1975 to 1980 prior to his PhD and was Professor of Hydrology and Water Resources at the University of Arizona from 1984 to 2003. He's published over 100 papers in diverse fields of research, including snow hydrology, alpine hydrology and biogeochemistry, polar snow and ice, contaminant hydrology, and water quality. In 2007, he was named acting director and in 2008 director of UC Merced's Sierra Nevada Research Institute. At Merced, Dr. Bales organized the Mountain Hydrology Research Group, which is deploying new research instrumentation at several Sierra Nevada sites, and has multiple ongoing collaborative projects investigating mountain hydrology. He also has continuing research in Greenland and Antarctica. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Roger Bales. Okay. Thank you, Camille. I'm very happy to be here and always happy to give some of my views on, on water uh, based on our, our research, our collaborative research. This uh, first, first slide gives a bit of an artist's conception of what I'm going to talk about, largely about uh, measurements and how we can apply better measurements to, uh, to, as I say, transform water management. An outline, I'm going to just give a little bit of introduction to the water supply setting that I, I think is relevant to this, uh, review a few advances in water information as to where I think they are, for uh, making the transition from research to applications uh, in the context of water security, and then finally come back to another topic that, that is really closely related to this forest management, which I, you'll see how that ties in, I think, when I, when I get there. So first, I am going to focus on the Sierra Nevada, which serves uh, water to over 60% of California's, uh, some water to over 60% of California's population and is responsible for, you know, a multi-billion dollar uh, annual, annual economy. As an introduction to Sierra Nevada water, I just, I just want to point out that there, uh, this is from a report oh, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, that there are, uh, something like 150 or so dam, dams in the Sierra Nevada, ranging from high elevation hydropower dams to these large low ele elevation dams like Folsom Dam on the bottom. O'Shaughnessy is, of course, the, the uh, dam that provides water to Hetch Hetchy and, and uh, consistently, I guess, a couple hundred million dollars a year worth of hydropower uh, revenue to the uh, city of, of San Francisco. So most of the 20-some Rivers have multiple, in the Sierra Nevada, major rivers, and, and, and the smaller streams on the east side have uh, multiple dams uh, uh, draining them. 
Now, what sort of water information do we use, do we use now? We, you know, taking a basic water balance, which is precipitation equals evapotranspiration or you know, evaporation and, and water use by plants, uh, plus runoff. Uh, you know, groundwater, discharge to groundwater is a, is a smaller term and in some cases not insignificant in the Sierra Nevada, but I'm going to ignore it for this purposes, for this purpose. So basically in the Sierra Nevada, we measure precipitation at a few locations. There's available, uh, you know, snowpack measurements. So snow, snow and rain are the, are the two components of the precipitation. Uh, for research purposes, we measure evapotranspiration at a few sites, and, and stream flow is measured at a few sites in the Sierra Nevada. But forecasts of uh, water runoff are based largely on precipitation and, and snowpack uh, measurements and a few stream flow uh, measurements at, at sites where forecasts are made. So just by way of orientation, precipitation does increase in going from the southern Sierra to the northern Sierra. This is a cutout on this slide of the Sierra Nevada cut out of California goes from uh, precipitation goes from maybe half a meter or so of water in the southern Sierra to over two meters in some of the northern uh, northern Sierra at the same time the snow the fraction of the precipitation that falls as snow increases in the southern Sierra now these are nice pictures, and you can download them. We've created pictures like this ourselves from uh, interpolated data, but they're at best a guess of how much precipitation there is uh, spatially in in the Sierra Nevada. But they're still uh, useful for for forecasts. So right now, at the operational level. I just want to review quickly what's done at the operational level. So, I mean, some of you uh, know this quite well, but I want to uh, just review it. Uh, to forecast the runoff volume in a river to, that feeds in into decision-making for how much water to allocate to different users, whether to generate how much hydropower today versus next week versus uh, next <laughs> month, or uh, those sort of, of planning. People use empirical and regression models based on a few index sites where snowpack and is measured in the snow zone of the Sierra Nevada. So there's a statistical relationship between snow and the total runoff volume over a season. And then precipitation forecasts uh, fit into that as well. So this would, this would then feed into the decision making uh, around you know, how much water is going to be discharged, say, per year into Folsom Dam or, or, uh, or uh, something like that. Now, I want to jump to some data for a moment and ask how well we can forecast the annual flow into, into a river, and I picked the American River, which, of course, flows into Sacramento, taking the time period from 1930 to 2010 on this bottom panel we have the natural flow, or you know, the, its natural flow is the term that the uh, water resources community uses for the measured flow plus the best estimate of diversions before the me you know upstream of the measurement site. So it's it's the flow that would have occurred were there no diversions uh, out of the river upstream of the measurement site. So it's not a measured but a reconstructed flow, but it's our best estimate of how much flow is in the river. Uh, normalized by the average over this time period from 1930 to 2010. So wet years are obviously above the line and, and dry years below the line. And I've, uh, I've shaded the ones that are more than 40%, either red or green, uh, ab above or below the, uh, the mean to highlight the wettest years and the driest years. And one can just see that you know, we've had some pretty long dry periods in the last uh, couple, of, couple of decades. Then on the upper panel is, is one measure of the skill of, these, uh, of the forecasts that are made by uh, colleagues at the uh, Department of Water Resources and, and uh, National Weather Service and, uh, and so forth, other agencies. 
but these are actually from the DWR reports. So the percent bias is, is basically the uh, uh, observed minus the forecast divided by the uh, observed times 100. So it's the, it's the, it's the difference between, so uh, abo- uh, points that are above would be an over forecast, points that are below would be an under forecast. And we can see that uh, many of these points fall outside the 20, 30, even 40% uh, boundary on here. And if your, your eye tells you that the uh, shaded uh, circles, the shaded green circles, which are the low flow years, tend to be over forecast. And to some extent, the ones with the cross, the plus in them, which are the higher flow years, tend to be uh, more under forecast than, than over forecast. And when we look at the statistics of this over this long time period, uh, mean and standard deviation of the forecast for these dividing it into three ter- into not tersiles but the the medium and then the wet and the dry uh, years we see that on average the wet and the and the medium years we yeah, if we average out all our forecasts the over and under forecasts sort of over long times uh, sort of balance out but the dry years are consistently under under forecast or over forecast rather. And they're over forecast by quite a bit. When we look again at the uh, taking the absolute value of the forecast, so whether it's o- or the percent bias rather, whether it's over or under forecast, we see that about half of the forecasts are within 15% of the observed, or the na- what I'm calling observed is the naturalized flow. Okay, so. On average, we have a 15%, but the 75th percentile, that tells us that 25% of the time, we're no better than 30%, plus or minus 30% of what actually occurred. Now, I would submit that there's a lot of um, room for better decision-making and more economic value and more optimization of ecosystem services if we could shift this curve downward, especially in the really wet and the really dry years where there are uh, often the, the, the least accurate, the least skilled forecasts. Also point out that uh, shorter term forecasts, uh, th- these are year long forecasts, annual stream flow, shorter term forecasts uh, based on historical data tend to have similar lim- limitations on prediction skill. If you go to colleagues that make Shorter term forecasts, say for hydropower, they're pulling up a spreadsheet and they're comparing what's out there now to what was out there in the most similar year or years in the past that they can, they can uh, find in the record. And they say that's fine, but what about with, when climate warming occurs and we're getting rain instead of snow at some of these sites? Well, yeah, we'd expect the forecast skill to, to decrease uh, further. So that's just a, a quick example, or a, a single example, rather, of, of the state of uh, forecast skill for, for water supply right now, and where I think there's significant room for improvement, particularly in, the, in these outlier uh, years. It doesn't help that on average you can, you can forecast uh, accurately if you don't, can't do it year to year. Now, I've talked about you know, using precipitation to estimate runoff. When you get internally in the water cycle, which is what you need to, to uh, estimate if one's going to use something more sophisticated than a regression equation, or uh, you know, we, don't, we, we really don't know, We're using precipitation and snowpack storage. So if you look at the mountain water cycle, the the two main reservoirs are snowpack storage and soil water storage or subsurface storage. Together, those are about equal to all the water storage behind the dams uh, in, the, in the Sierra Nevada. But we have you know, the timing of snowmelt, the uh, amount of uh, evapotranspiration relative to the uh, you know, temperature and elevation and so forth that uh, would be needed if we're going to go to more uh, more physically based models that potentially have a, a, a greater ability to improve the forecast skill. So it's a, it's, at this point, it's a myth that we can use the current data to uh, 
estimate or predict these quantities, any of these quantities, with a high degree of skill. <clears throat> now, a couple of additional points that I'm not necessarily going to illustrate, we, but um, we can't model our way out of this uncertainty. We need more data. Uh, that is, there are good models out there. There need to be some improvements in modeling, but improvements in forecast skill, uh, the community is cons research community is consistently saying you need new observations. Now, fortunately, the technology to support these observations is available, and it's matured over the past five to ten years so that we believe it's now can be depended on not just for research but for operational uh, hydrology. So to go from the situation where I've illustrated the data flow with a fire hose here, where you have a couple drops of data coming into a simple model, you get a couple of numbers out of the, out of the uh, uh, forecast, we can go to some much more data-rich environment, uh, enable a more sophisticated model, and get much uh, more skilled and time-resolved and, and spatially-resolved uh, forecasts from the data. Okay, what, it, what are these uh, measurement opportunities that uh, we're, we're working on? Available now, uh, data from satellites, aircraft, wireless sensor networks, and advanced modeling tools can be blended together. This is a, probably the first wireless sensor network we put out in the mountains about uh, seven or eight years ago, I guess. And the, uh, the, the company that provided these radios went out of business, so we've switched over to using a, a citrus-based uh, system, which is in, maybe you can see it somewhere in these slides, or uh, another slide is developed through, through UC, uh, which has been very robust over the past five or six years. Price of sensors and reliability of sensors has come down, Satellite snow cover technology has matured. LIDAR technology is getting there to where we can start to use it. Uh, but you know, adding all these together may bring also some big data challenges for the, that the water resources community has not traditionally had to face. So quickly, satellite snow cover data, what do we do with that? Um, plus spatial energy balance data. So satellite snow cover, this is 500 meter resolution for the Southern Sierra from the MODIS satellite. This time series started in 2000. It continues to the present when MODIS is, there'll be another launch of another satellite. So uh, we feel reasonably good that the federal government will continue to provide data of this quality or better quality going into the future. Fortunately, there are several meteorological stations in the Sierra Nevada that provide you know, energy balance and, and so forth, information. Together, those can give us real-time uh, real estimates of daily and seasonal snow melt. That if, if there's snow out there and the energy balance says it'll melt, you can get an estimate of how much will melt across the landscape. We can then back, also back calculate how much water was stored in the snowpack at the end of the season. And we can project how the snowpack and snowmelt may change with, with different climate. Just as an example of, the, of this first calculation of snow, uh, snowmelt, this is a time series. I'm sorry, these are numbered by, by calendar year day in, in 2007 in this case. And this is snow-covered area fraction, the fraction of each pixel that's covered by snow, where white is a lot of snow, dark is a little snow, and if it's not shaded, there was no snow detected by elevation. So the higher elevations, the highest snow cover persists through the season longest and then melts out. And on the bottom is calculated by this method the amount of snow melt in each elevation band, with each line being a cumulative for as you go up in elevation. So the difference between the two lines is the amount that occurred in that 300-meter elevation band. So January, we see... In the Merced, this is the Yosemite outline, so the Merced River Basin is Yosemite Valley, southern, southern Yosemite. Um, sort of a maximum snow cover for this dry year, 2007. 
jump ahead a month, February, still similar snow cover. Similar snow cover jumping ahead in March. Not much uh, snow. There's been a little snow melt at these lower elevations. You see the snow melt curve starting to go up. And you see, obviously, some loss at the lower elevations below 7,000 feet, I believe, or here. Then you jump ahead a month or so to April. Late April, quite a bit of decline in snow-covered area. Snow melt, we're melting out the snowpack um, below 9,000 feet, basically. And as we continue later in the year, depend on the higher elevations for uh, snow melt. And at the, by May of this year, it's only the very highest elevations um, above thir- you know, 12 or 13,000 feet that are providing snow melt. And by July of that year, we're basically gone. The snow's basically gone. Okay, and then if we look at wet, dry, and average years in the Merced, uh, further north of Tuolumne, and then some basins south of there, we see really reasonably consistent patterns from year to year in what fraction of the snow melt came from a given elevation. That's what this, this graph shows, elevation on the ordinate fraction of snow melt from that elevation on the abscissa. Uh, and there's not that much interannual variability. There is some variability between basins because of the elevation range, and the, the shaded bars indicate how much of the elevation, what fraction of the basin is in that uh, elevation, elevation uh, range. So we feel reasonably good that these are probably the best estimates of, that these are the best estimates of the spatial Snow melt, snow water equivalent, and uh, the uh, snowpack contributions to runoff that have, that have been uh, developed. And it's, our group has done this, and a couple other groups have done, done the, the same sort of thing for, with uh, different purposes, some of the same basins, some different basins in the, in the Sierra Nevada. So these data have become relatively, uh, uh, the algorithms at least, are relatively available. Also, as a footnote, most, most of the snow melt comes from elevations above where any routine measurements are. As the routine measurements only go up to about these elevations, about 2,400 or, or 2,700 uh, uh, meters at the highest for most areas. Uh, and I said that we can use this, these data as projections of climate warming. Well... One, one way, simple way we do that without a climate model is to simply, this is again the amount of snow melt taking these uh, Kings River uh, data here, which actually drains Kings Canyon National Park, and, and shifting the temperature by either 2, 4, or 6 degrees. That has, that has the effect of basically shifting the snowpack up in elevation. When you do that, you get... Uh, when you shift the snowpack up in elevation, you get obviously less snow melt from that elevation zone. So a very simple planning tool that water agencies have have looked at in terms of thinking about how much storage am I going to lose when we have as we have climate warming, and where am I going to get that storage back? Now let me just comment a little bit on sensor networks. Five to ten years ago, the first set. The first, most of the sensor networks we put out had wires. We were stringing wires around the forest. Rodents love to chew on them. Uh, bears love to dig them up. We, we lost a lot of data unless we really hardened them with expensive conduit, which researchers are not necessarily prone to do on, on large scale. And we were limited by short wire lengths because uh, of uh, voltage drops and so forth. Now we're using wireless uh, routinely, not really putting out any more wired networks for the past, say, five years, or four, four to five years. Um, and this is one location in the, Kings, in the American River Basin, uh, again, showing the, the technology that my uh, colleague, uh, working with my colleague Steve Glazier, we've started uh, deploying. Uh, and then the strategies is to deploy them spatially to, in about a one-kilometer footprint to get a representative measurement because these snow pillows that are out, I mean, the operational measurements that are out there give you a point measurement, usually in a meadow, that's not representative of the broader landscape. 
when you look at the American River Basin, what's out there in terms of operational measurements now, that the you know, same measurements that researchers use, you have mainly these green triangles for snow and, weather st and some additional weather stations where the red circles are, or the small circles here, and there aren't very many of them in the mountains. So we measure snow and, energy and some component of the energy balance at only a few locations. Uh, these ye larger yellow circles are, are monthly measurements of, of snow. So we've undertaken a project to instrument the snow-covered part of this American River Basin. So this is the American River Basin again. This is a snow-covered image from more of an average year, 2008, uh, sort of typical winter snow-covered snow area, uh, complete snow cover in the higher elevations, partial snow cover observed by satellite in the lower elevation. And say, okay, if we were going to characterize the snow depth, because the satellite's measure telling you where snow is, it's not telling you how much snow is out there, and the water manager wants to know how much snow is out there. So do some researchers. So, you know, American River Basin, this is Lake Tahoe over here. So getting snow depth is where we turn to the ground-based sensors and soil moisture and temperature and all these things that the satellite doesn't measure. So uh, one of the students here at, at, uh, at, at Cal Berkeley undertook for a thesis project to do an optimization uh, project on where would you put the sensors to get a cons over, the, over time to get a consistent, uh, to develop a consistent surface of snow-covered area. And he came up with a cluster analysis approach where you cluster the basin into areas of similar uh, snow accumulation, you know, using the reconstructed products that I mentioned earlier, such as I showed for the Merced Basin, and found that uh, you know this cluster approach gave much better than just a random placement or probably even my expert placement of putting sensors out there, and told us that we needed about you know five clusters and four to five groups of sensors, with each group having ten to fifteen sensors in it. Uh, to characterize the snowpack and, and uh, other conditions in the basin. So proposed locations from, from his work uh, scattered around the basin. We've adjusted them slightly so that we can take advantage of the existing infrastructure and not have to put in complete new infrastructure because we want to telemeter the data out. If there's already telemetry, we'll take advantage of it. And if somebody's out, already out there doing maintenance on sensors, why they can just add our sensors to, the, to that maintenance. So what's in progress now is putting these uh, sensors out, out uh, and the research question is to say, were we right on how many sensors we needed and, and where to put them? But this is, the strat this is part of our strategy that we've undertaken, both at the smaller scale and this scale, to provide basically spatial data over time to feed into um, addition, uh, better forecasts. And this is just some photos of the node construction at one of the sites where, we've, uh, where it's fairly quick and simple to, to get things erected. Uh, basically, you can put in a whole site, I think, within a week, including getting the electronics and the, and the uh, radios uh, working. So using radios rather than wires for the communication. Another technology that we haven't really isn't quite there yet, but is getting close is LIDAR. So this is an area where we've, working with my colleague Xinhua Guo at Merced, a photo of an area where did LIDAR coverage. This is his digital reconstruction of the same thing using uh, LIDAR from aircraft. And when we use LIDAR to measure snow, Snow off, snow on, you know, subtract the two, you get snow depth. We can do pretty well in open or in the gaps in the canopy. Because you know, remember, much of the Sierra Nevada is forested. This shows, this bottom panel shows by elevation. And I'm sorry, elevation's on the abscissa here, but this, this uh, shows the, uh, I guess, f the canopy cover fraction, the fraction of the area that is. Uh, 
in that elevation band that, that has canopy closure. And so we can get pretty good data on the open, and the question is how much is under the canopy. So I just point out we see a fairly consistent elevation increase in snow depth here. Uh, drop off at the higher elevation, it's no trees, it's windswept. Uh, it's also steep. And below this, eleva this elevation of about 2,000 meters, we get rain and snow mixed together. Therefore, you get less snow uh, accumulation. So we have started to get some estimates for how much snow is under the canopy, but you get very few LIDAR returns in, a, in these dense canopies. So that's still a, a research challenge. And then finally, um, another, you know, the other major component of the water balance, besides the precipitation, which in this case we're focusing on the snow zone to get snow, is the evapotranspiration to help us constrain this precipitation evapotranspiration runoff uh, equation with my colleague Mike Goulden and at, at UC Irvine and others, we have measured over a broad elevation range the evapotranspiration. And we're getting numbers that are, to some ecologists, surprisingly high, around 800 millimeters per year in these dense uh, forests using eddy correlation uh, flux towers. Drop off at the higher elevation because it's cold in the winter and the trees shut down. Drop off at the lower elevations because it's too dry in the summer. They don't get enough precipitation. But in this happy zone, we get a broad range, uh, broad elevation range of high evapotranspiration. So this is, this is the other, another important piece of the uh, puzzle that's been missing from our uh, water, water balance uh, modeling. And I should say that the flux tower data are consistent with a little bit lower, but I think probably better than or more cons consistent with our ground-based measurements that give slightly higher values. And then we feed this into hydrologic modeling and say, does data make a difference? Well, yeah, it does. I'm just going to show one quick example here of hydrologic modeling in this particular small basin of uh, a couple of square kilometers over about a six-year period. Uh, looks like five-year period. Uh, and just feeding in our different rain versus snow inputs gives us a huge increase in, uh, in, in forecast skill and, and, or modeling skill and fitting the data. In this case, you know, many, in many areas where hydrologic modeling is done, there are two inputs, precip total precipitation and temperature. Then it's evaluated versus stream flow. In this case, at least we're putting in precipitation as snow, precipitation as rain separately. And beyond that, we're putting, you're using soil moisture data and evapotranspiration data and so forth to constrain the modeling. And uh, we feel then we're getting enough, using the model basically to integrate the data and getting a high enough skill level to start using it for verification and validation of what's happening uh, in the basin as uh, as as management, uh, as, as there are changes in the basin due to, due to management. So I want to introduce just very quickly the, uh, the concept of water security that leads us to think more about the uh, link between uh, water management and, and ecosystem management. California and much of the U.S. has, has maybe the highest water security of almost any place in the world because we have in, for, in part because we have infrastructure to store, transport, and treat water. With storage being, if you look globally, storage being maybe the key indicator of water security around the world. We're also working on strengthening institutions in California for uh, making them more adaptable. And sometimes we call these hard and soft uh, solutions. But I submit that the, really the foundation to being successful on either as we adapt to changing conditions is better and more accessible information. That we, We're not going to have this interplay and maintain our water security without better information. And by that, I mean, you know, there's my, my definition of water security on the bottom of the slide. It's getting the right amount of water when you need it. But water is fundamental to ecosystem services, too. Uh, 
translates into managing those ecosystem services, especially with climate change, we're managing ecosystem services in order to manage uh, water. So that leads me to forest management, which is managing ecosystem services in the Sierra Nevada. Now, much of the precip, obviously, much of the precip falling on dense Sierra Nevada forest never gets into the streams. We're getting you know, specific yields of anywhere from 20% to 60% of the precipitation ending up as runoff, depending on where you are in the Sierra Nevada. We know that forest densities are much higher than they were, say, 150 years ago. Uh, you, you see these historical photos of being able to drive a team of horses pulling a wagon through the forest. Sometimes you have trouble just uh, skiing through the forest uh, now where it's, it's so dense. So this uh, very simple uh, compilations of data, I'm not showing the data, but this is from a paper in the literature that we used to estimate if one reduces, can if one has canopy cover of 90%, which is typical of many areas of Sierra Nevada forest, you take it down to 60 or 50%, you, get, you, sh you would expect a measurable reduction, assuming about a meter or 1,000 millimeters of water. You would expect a measurable reduction, maybe about 9% uh, increase in water yield based on a compilation of, of data from many locations. And we'd estimate that with sustained management, maybe it could increase water yield by up to 16% in the densest uh, forests. But these are based on very limited data and they're not, not based on sufficient data to get any investments in that. Another, you know, another fact, you know, one factor, there's two factors to that. You thin the forest, there's less evapotranspiration because there's less vegetation. The other is uh, there's less interaction between the snowpack and the canopy. So here's one research project that's underway. This is an experimental forest near Pinecrest or near Dodge Ridge Ski Area, if anybody's been up there. Uh, where there's some you know, very dense forest and some of it's been thinned in various prescriptions. Not what I call a restoration treatment, but about halfway to a restoration treatment. And we did a snow survey uh, a couple weeks ago out there and huge differences, snow under a closed canopy, snow at the drip edge of trees and closed canopy versus out in the small openings or these gaps that have been opened up in the forest 50% more snow, of course. Uh, we knew that anecdotally, and we knew that from some of our previous research, but this is the largest single measurement campaign we have where, where we were actually looking at the impact of, of thinning, and we're repeating that survey probably, uh, probably next week. So you get more snow on the ground. That is, with a dense canopy, you intercept snow. The, also, the radiation is absorbed by the trees. It's re-emitted to melt these big tree wells you see. Small gaps, you get snow accumulation, less long wave melting of these. But if you open it up too much, you get this low angle winter sun shining on the snowpack and melting the snow in the, in the openings. So thinning the forest just right is, is important and not just uh, thinning it. When we model that using the, you know, the same model I showed uh, previously uh, in terms of pretty much direct offset, reducing evapotranspiration as you reduce, think of leaf area index as an indication of vegetation reduction. So if you go down in the forest where I was modeling here, 50% reduction in leaf area index would be what my silviculture colleagues tell me is a restoration treatment. So... Uh, Reasonably important uh, gains in this, in this dry year. Three centimeters, 96 centimeters of precipitation, but in this catchment, there's only about 20 centimeters of runoff. So 15% increase in, in runoff in this particular year in this basin. And a, and a, a little, you know, reasonably comparable in, in this wet year as to the dry year. So some final thoughts to wrap up here. Uh, forecasting. The water supply, we think, could reduce uncertainty due to the land surface fluxes. It's not going to help improve weather forecast necessarily by about 50%. Even a few percent improvements, this is worth real money. If, uh, one number I've, 
uh, got from a, a colleague at, at Davis is that high elevation hydropower, or a paper done by somebody up there, uh, about a billion and a half a year. You know, even a 1% or 10, 5% increase is real money if you can in, enhance the, uh, uh, reduce the uncertainty and because there's water being spilled right now. Uh, or not, not this year, but uh, in wet years at least and average years because of imperfect information. Uh, better information is the foundation of water security. And if we're going to undertake sustained forest management, that's going to require somebody to pay for it, that is the beneficiaries of the water to pay for it. So better information is going to be needed for that sort of verification. So that's uh, you know, some additional thoughts on why we, why we need that better information. So you know, again, research is still needed on several of these points, uh, particularly on the systems engineering, the economics, and, and to some extent the modeling and, and blending of you know, learning how to use these, these uh, fire hose size data streams as opposed to trickle size data streams. Uh, and uh, some of that's going on and some of it's not yet started. I'll stop there and just leave these acknowledgements. I didn't annotate each slide about whose research it was, but these are some of my uh, key collaborators, so thanks for listening. Okay, well, <clears throat> thanks for a great talk. We'll start questions. So um, I'm curious why the density of forests are so much greater today than 150 years ago. Well, uh, it's partly because they've been managed not for multiple ecosystem services, but for mainly two things. And I'm involved with some colleagues here at, at, at UC Berkeley in a, a forest adaptive management project. They're managed to keep houses from burning because of the wildland urban interface. So you put out fires because you don't want to lose property. You know. And second, they're managed for as, as wildlife refuges. Now, those are two important ecosystem services, people living there and wildlife, but there's others that you sort of need to put in the mix that haven't been at the table. So they go in, basically, and, and weed out the, the branches and things, and so more trees grow and it makes a higher density? Well, the, the, the other question is they don't have any money now to catch up with the forest management that needs to be done. But basically, it's because they basically take all the brush and debris and it lets more trees... They don't... They, well, there's two things. They mean, when, when, for, when forests are thin, they let a timber contract, and they try to break even on that, and the timber company will take out the saleable timber, and then they'll either be told to leave the slash, and they'll go back and burn it, or else take it out, and maybe in some cases, if it's short enough haul distances, use it for biofuel. I mean, yeah. And that, that's what causes the higher density of trees. Not thinning is what's caused the higher density in putting out fires. Okay. Okay. Hi, my question is around uh, carbon sequestration uh, that might be impacted by the removal or thin thinning of the forest. Have you done any work or have you seen any studies done regarding what the carbon fixing impact would be of thinning the forest? We've not done any, my, at least the colleagues I work with, we've not done any. We've talked about needing to do it to really understand. I mean, my silviculture colleagues tell me that you, if you do this thinning and start managing the forest more actively, then you can get to the point you can sequester more carbon in the soil and actually get more root mass relative to above ground mass and you know, start that whole cycle that, of the biological carbon sequestration that we're that has been laid out conceptually for us, but we haven't really researched in the Sierra Nevada. So that's a huge knowledge gap. <laughs> so do we have any more questions for Dr. Bales? Okay, well, thank you again for a fantastic talk. Thank you. Thank you.